want to share with you a story that is a good bit longer than I would normally read from the pulpit, and I tried hard to get around using this story, but I just couldn't, get, couldn't do it because I thought it was too good not to use. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read to you for a little while longer. Um, it's a story of a monastery that had fallen on hard times, and it begins this way. They were once a great order, but as a result of waves of anti-monastic persecution in the 17th and 18th centuries and the rise of secularism in the 19th, all of its branch houses were lost and it had become decimated to the extent that there were only five monks left in the decaying mother house. The abbot and four others, all over 70 in age. Clearly it was a dying order. In the deep woods surrounding the monastery, there was a hermitage. As the abbot agonized over the imminent death of his order, it occurred to him to visit the hermitage and ask if, by some possible chance, the hermit could offer any advice that might save the monastery. The hermit welcomed the abbot at his hut, but when the abbot explained the purpose of his visit, the hermit could only commiserate with him. I know how it is, he exclaimed. The spirit has gone out of the people. It's the same in all the nearby towns. So the old abbot and the hermit commiserated together. When the time came when the abbot had to leave, they embraced each other. It has been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said, but I still have failed in my purpose for coming here. Is there nothing you can tell me, no piece of advice you can give me, that would help me save my dying order? No, I'm sorry, the hermit responded. I have no advice to give. The only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is one of you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him to ask, Well, what did the hermit say? Now, he couldn't help, the abbot answered. We just commiserated and read the scriptures together. The only thing he did say, just as I was leaving, it was something cryptic, was that the Messiah is one of us. I don't know what he meant. And in the days and weeks and months that followed, the old monks pondered these words and wondered whether there was, whether there was any possible significance. The Messiah is one of us. Could he possibly have met one of us monks here at the monastery? If that's the case, which one? Do you suppose he met the abbot? Yes, if he met anyone, he probably met the abbot. He's been our leader for more than a generation. On the other hand, he might have met Brother Thomas. Certainly, Brother Thomas is a holy man. Everyone knows that Thomas is a man of light. Certainly, he could not have met Brother Elrond. Elrond gets crotchety at times, but... Come to think of it, even though he's a thorn in people's sides, when you look back at it, Elrod is virtually always right, often very right. Maybe the hermit did mean Brother Elrod. But surely not Brother Philip. Philip is so passive, a real nobody. But then, almost mysteriously, he has a gift for somehow always being there when you need him. He just magically appears by your side. Maybe Philip is the Messiah. Of course the hermit didn't mean me, each one of them thought. He couldn't possibly have meant me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet supposing he did. Suppose I'm the Messiah. Oh God, not me. I couldn't be that much for you, could I? And as the monks contemplated in this manner, they began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the off chance that one among them might be the Messiah. And on the off, off chance that each monk himself might be the Messiah, they began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. Now, because the forest in which it was situated was beautiful, it so happened that people still occasionally came to visit the monastery to picnic on its tiny lawn, and to wander among the paths, and even now and then to go into the dilapidated old chapel and spend some time meditating. As they did so, without even being conscious of it, they sensed an aura of extraordinary respect they began to surround these five old monks and just to radiate out from the place and permeate the atmosphere of the monastery. There was something strangely attractive, even compelling about it. Hardly knowing why, they began to come back to the monastery more frequently to picnic, to play, and to pray. They began to bring their friends to show them a special place, and their friends brought their friends. And then it happened that some of the younger men began to spend some time talking to the old monks. After a while, one asked if he could join them, and then another, and another. So within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order, and thanks to the hermit's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. Imagine, if you will, how 
transformative it might be if we learn to treat people as if they really matter and have special value just by virtue of being, as if they were special and unique, as if they truly were children of God, as if they might be the Messiah, and the Messiah is among us. Our parable in chapter 25 of Matthew this morning wraps up a chapter of parables that talk about what the kingdom is, and what the kingdom will be like, and what this is all heading toward. It sums up these scenes of, of judgment and sorting and separation and such, but I don't think it means what we oftentimes would like for it to. If we're not careful here, we'll find ourselves in that same trap that I've talked about the last couple of weeks as we've been in this chapter. We might find ourselves so overly focused on the final judgment that we miss the rest of it. We might get mired in trying to parse the meaning of what does it mean to help and who do we help. Who is the least? We might be like that one who asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And do we really have to go to prisons and do we really have to see sick people and all of that? And if we do this, we miss the whole point. See, judgment is God's business, thanks be to God. Who is in and who is out is not for us to decide and really, honestly, not even for us to worry that much about if we trust that God can handle that. Certainly the story is about judgment, but I think it's about something much, much more. It, as the other stories in the chapter are also, is about learning to recognize the coming of Christ into our lives and our presence daily and to respond to that presence in faith and in service and in love. In the parable of the bridesmaids, which we studied two weeks ago, we're taught to stay awake, to be alert, to be on the lookout because the bridesmaid, or the bridegroom, is coming at some time that we won't expect. Christ is coming into our lives all the time, and we never know for sure when. And last week, we saw in the story of the, the servants and their master that this God that we worship and this God that we serve is a God of unbelievable generosity and trust in us. To entrust to us this incredible treasure of the gospel of forgiveness and reconciliation and of the kingdom to share. And today we begin to see it all begin to come back together. Jesus calls all people to him and separates them out. And the final sorting seems to have very little to do with what they believe and a whole lot to do with what they did. And that's sort of true, but we'll come back around to that. There's a couple of things that, that I think we need to keep in mind as we look at this parable. And the first one is this. The sheep and the goats are kept together the whole time. There's no way to tell ahead of time who is in, who is out. It's really kind of pointless for us to try, don't you think? All of those who see this gathering of people might try to figure out who's going to be on the good side and who's going to be on the bad side, but ultimately, that's not our decision. The next thing is that I find it interesting that both the sheep and the goats are surprised at the end. The sheep didn't realize what they had done. The goats didn't realize what they hadn't done. They both had actually failed to notice that Christ was coming to them every day. They both failed to recognize the presence of God in those around them. It just happened that some people still knew the value of people and, and were willing to reach out and help. This next one would probably get me in trouble if I followed along it path too long. The word that's translated there about bringing the peoples back together is actually the Greek ta ethna, which is better translated probably the nations. I came across somebody this week who suggested that one way to read this is that this judgment is not of individuals, but that perhaps what if this is a judgment of nations for how they treat the marginalized and vulnerable and overlooked among them. I said that one would just get me in trouble if I followed that path very long here. But it's worth thinking about, isn't it? That maybe God isn't just looking at what we do with our own lives, but what we do. And then the final judgment part of this is really not for us to figure out or, or to explain. What we are to do is to live out the truth that we have come to know of this gospel of forgiveness and of reconciliation and trust that the amazingly generous God we're serving will take care of the rest of it for us. Our job and what, what happened with the sheep 
As Father Capon, who I quoted last week, said, the sheep are praised not so much necessarily for what they did, but they are praised for trusting him, that is Jesus, to have had a relationship with them all along and learning to recognize that relationship in people. When we think about this judgment thing, remember that it is a judgment by a God who exists to us in that relationship and in people. In other words, now, our task as followers of Christ is not to keep count of who we serve and how, so that perhaps we can make a good case to God if the score comes out too tight. And our task is not necessarily to always go out of our way just to find those people who are overlooked and marginalized and most needy. But our task is to stop trying to avoid those things. And sometimes it is to go out of our way and find those who nobody notices. Our task is not to try to make sure that we do what is needed so that we can be classified as a sheep later on. Our job is to serve people and to love people, and in doing so, we love and we serve God. Our calling as followers of Christ is to see in others around us the value that they have as children of God, to recognize the spark of the divine in each person, and to help them to see that as well, to help others see that, that God dwells among them and lives with them as well. And out of all of that, we are to feed those who are hungry, not just spiritually, but physically. We are to provide refreshment to those whose lips and souls are parched and dry. We are to provide clothing and dignity to those left with nothing in a world of plenty. We are to, prov to provide companionship, friendship to those who are in prison, whether it's behind actual bars or in the loneliness of their lives or in the confusion of their minds. We're to recognize that the Messiah is among us, might well be one of us, certainly lives in us and is often in disguise, so we best be awake and alert and about the work to which we're called. Because how we treat people matters. How we see people matters. Because people matter. Because that is where we find God. How else can we respond to the radical grace and the generosity that we have come to know in this God, but to share radically this grace and this generosity with all those around us? A few years ago, Emily and I read a book called Same Kind of Different as Me. And if you haven't read it, you should. Um, easily one of the most challenging and encouraging books that I've ever read. It's one of those that you don't want to put down, but that you just want to push far away at the same time. Because... It gets right into your business. I mean, right in the middle of it all. It's a story of one of the most unlikely and transformative friendships that I've ever heard of. It's written by two gentlemen, Ron Hall and Denver Moore. Ron is a, a wealthy white art dealer out of the Metroplex who was living a very, very comfortable life when his wife started volunteering at one of the shelters in Fort Worth. And I can't remember if it was Presbyterian Night Shelter or Union Gospel Mission. Thank you, Union Gospel Mission. But I loaned the book out, so I can't find it. So if you have it, um, just keep it. So if I loaned it to you, just keep it. You need to read it more than I do. Um, but his wife saw this one gentleman there who most people avoided. In fact, most people were a little bit afraid of. He was a large, angry, homeless man who had grown up on a plantation in Louisiana, and nobody reached out to him. And she challenged her husband to reach out to this man because she believed that that man could change the city. But what it needed, he needed was someone to see him for who he was and for more than what people thought he was. So over time, they became friends. And then Denver actually became really a member of their family. In fact, lived with the family for a good portion of his life. Denver died a couple of years ago. But he died a very different man than he had been years earlier. Because one person saw in him the value that he had. One person saw Jesus in him. And his life was changed. But his was not the only one changed. Ron Hall's life was changed every bit as much as Denver's was. As was Ron's family. But that's what happens when we minister to each other. When we serve one another. When we see Jesus in one another. And we love each other as if we truly are trying to show our love to God. We open our lives to the coming of the Christ. And we see glimpses 
of this kingdom that is to come, that is already here and is coming among us. And it's a kingdom of people who know that Christ comes every day in a lot of different ways. See, in valuing others just because they're valuable, we learn to see who we really are and we learn to know who God truly is. The sheep didn't know what they'd done. Oftentimes we don't know. But what they did do was they, they looked for opportunities. We now know that our task is to minister to Jesus. Not just to minister for Jesus, but to minister to the Jesus that is around us. The goats didn't know either what they had done, and sometimes we don't either. We fail to recognize what's going on around us. We have to be alert. We have to be away. Now there's a danger in reading this story, and that is that it can begin very much to sound like the sheep somehow earned their way into eternal life. There doesn't seem to be a lot of room for grace here because it looks very much like a works-based salvation. But I think if you read these parables all together, you see a different story unfolding. Jesus seems to be absent from us after being <coughs> on earth. And during this absence, we're told to be awake, we're told to be ready, because we don't know when he's going to come back. That requires a tremendous amount of faith right there. We have to keep our lamps ready and be on the lookout. And while he's away, we have to understand that we have been entrusted as the body of Christ now with something that is a treasure beyond measure that we can't even possibly get our brains wrapped around. And that is this gospel of a kingdom that is of forgiveness and grace. It takes a tremendous amount of faith to trust that and to share that. The generous God who has given us this gift expects us to share it just as freely. And while we're waiting and looking and sharing, we have to be alert to the fact that this God we're waiting for might not be absent after all. Just might be showing up looking a little different than we thought. See, far from teaching that we can earn our way to heaven, I think these parables are actually all about grace and faith. It takes a tremendous amount of faith to believe that God will do what God says and then to stay alert and actively wait for that promise to be fulfilled, especially when it seems as if maybe God isn't paying attention. You ever been there? It took faith to get through that. It takes faith to believe that the well of God's grace is so deep that we can never, ever exhaust it, and that we can share it freely and trust that God will do what needs to be done. And it takes faith to see the value in people. And to honor that value, believing that God dwells in the homeless person or the smelly kid in class, just as much as in the saints and those who appear righteous and those who look like they have it all together. If the story were about people consciously trying to earn their way to heaven and they got in, then all of what we talk about here would be different. But I think it's instead a story about people who recognize that people matter. And by serving others, they found that they had found God. By serving others, they found that they had served God. And the story of the, the monks and their dying brotherhood, their brotherhood was renewed and revived by believing that the Messiah truly was among them, and therefore how they treated one another mattered a lot. And the new life that they found through this new respect and this new understanding changed not only them, but everyone who came in contact with them. And for Ron Hall and Denver Moore, two lives, two families, and through them entire communities, and then even well beyond that, with those who've heard their stories, have found their lives changed by the story of one person who saw the worth and the value in another person who was mostly overlooked. And Jesus says that when we do it for those who are overlooked, we've done it for him. Imagine how transformative it might be in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our world, if we all truly believed that all people deserve to be treated as if they're God's children. And that no one should go hungry or thirsty or naked or lonely or be humiliated or put down or left out. How different might things be? If we could learn to live like that 
and love like that, we might just find out that we've been looking for God in all the wrong places. And we might just find our lives changed and our world changed in ways that we could never have imagined. So I pray today that we might have the courage to live boldly, to love lavishly, and to have eyes that see the coming of Christ in unexpected ways all around us today and every day.